Welcome to HSC Economics Made Easy. This video is part of a series on fiscal policy. In my previous videos, I analyzed how fiscal policy can be used to influence economic activity, resource allocation, and income distribution. Today, I'm going to talk about whether they've been effective. One limitation that fiscal policy faces is time lag. There are two types of time lag, implementation and impact time lag. Compared to monetary policy, fiscal policy has a longer implementation time lag. This can happen because many discretionary changes to the budget often needs to go through first the House of Representatives and then the Senate. And this could be a process that could range from days to months depending on the agreeability of the change. It can be argued that the impact time lag is very short. For example, if the government wanted to implement expansionary fiscal policy, they would lower taxes or increase expenditure, and disposable incomes would increase almost immediately, leading to an increase in aggregate demand. However, it could also be argued that it could take months for the multiplier effect to be fully realized, meaning that there is still a bit of an impact time lag. The effectiveness of fiscal policy can also be limited by global influences, especially with expansionary stances. An example would be the expansionary fiscal policy used during the GFC in 2008 to 2010. Some estimations suggest that the fiscal stimulus boosted Australia's real GDP by 2.75% in 2008 to 2009 and 1.5% in 2009 to 2010. This helped to keep negative growth to only one quarter, technically avoiding a recession. On one hand, we could say that the fiscal stimulus had some success, but it nonetheless comes to show that fluctuations in the international business cycle can affect the Australian economy despite counter-cyclical policies. In Australia, political influences can impact the effectiveness of fiscal policy as well. Differences in economic ideology can often mean conflicting objectives. This could cause a deadlock in parliament, causing none of the objectives to be achieved, or at least implementation time lags. As mentioned previously, changes in fiscal policy might get through lower house, but get rejected in the upper house, especially when different parties have the majority in each of the houses. The election cycle can also have an influence. Because federal elections happen every three years, the strategy of the federal budget is often contained in a three-year time frame. Fiscal policy often becomes, or at least appears more expansionary in the year of an election, as politicians often want to show off how much they're spending or the tax cuts that they have delivered and contractionary policies to achieve fiscal consolidation usually immediately follow an election. An example would be the 2014 federal budget from the Abbott government, which was met with much criticism from the media for its harsh austerity measures, such as proposed user pay systems in the healthcare system, as well as a tax called the budget repair levy. And then in the following two budgets, there were more expansionary initiatives, such as asset tax write-offs for small businesses. As a side note, I want to cover a fourth objective that fiscal policy could aim for. This is not explicitly in the syllabus, but it could help you better understand Australian fiscal policy examples. Between winning the election in 2014 and 2020's coronavirus, the Liberal government was very focused on fiscal consolidation, which is to bring the budget from deficit to surplus. Have they been successful in achieving this objective? In 2019, Treasurer Josh Frydenberg announced that Australia was projected to reach a surplus. So over the six years in government, they have made progress towards this goal. But with the effects of the coronavirus on economic activity, the government has had to forego this objective and take an expansionary stance. It's also worth noting that the road to fiscal consolidation has not been smooth. In 2014, the budget deficit was nearly doubled despite the strong focus on trying to reduce it. This setback was a culmination of some of the above limitations, including slow global economic growth and the Australian Senate rejecting some of its proposed spending cuts and taxes. But one more factor that I want to explore is a common problem with austerity measures, which are measures with contractionary impacts on the economy. See, with a global slowdown, Australia was already facing reduced aggregate demand. To reach a budget surplus, fiscal policy would need to take on a contractionary stance, reducing spending, increasing taxes, and further reducing aggregate demand. As a result of this, unemployment increases and incomes fall, meaning that automatic stabilizers kick in and the government ends up spending even more and collecting less tax revenue. Their austerity measures become counterproductive. This is one of the rationales behind the Laffer curve, which theorizes that making tax rates too high will actually lead to less total tax revenue collected. Some of these last concepts are extension concepts, but I hope that you found my explanations and examples interesting and useful. If this video has helped you, please leave a like and comment as well as share the video too. Make sure you subscribe to the channel as well as follow us on Facebook to make sure you don't miss future videos. I look forward to continue to make HSA economics easy for you. See you next time.